Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I'm going to be taking you guys back to the year in 1996 to have a look at the Michael Bay action adventure movie The Rock. So you know the drill guys, I'm going to play you a trailer but before that let's go back to Alcatraz to see what's going on there and I will see you guys soon. John Mason, British national incarcerated on Alcatraz in 1962, escaped in 63. There's no identity in the United States or Great Britain. He does not exist. Secrets have a way of coming back to haunt you. There's a hostage situation on Alcatraz. Hostage, 81 tourist. The Rock's a tourist attraction. The one you train to defend you becomes your greatest threat. A battery of VX gas rockets is presently deployed to deliver a highly lethal strike on the population of the San Francisco Bay Area. And the one you abandon becomes your only hope. You go talk to him. Me? Yeah. Hiya. I'm an agent with the uh, F FBI. I'm Stanley Goodsby. But of course you are. At least he got his name right. Now, all that stands between a city and a disaster. The power of this chemical is way beyond anything you can imagine. That's where you're coming with us. Is a man who's never seen combat. You're a chemical freak. <laughs> I'm a chemical super freak, actually. And another who's been out of action for 30 years. Show us on the blueprints. I can't. My blueprint was in my head. Fortunately, some things you never forget. But don't worry, it'll all come back to me. From Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer, the producers of Top Gun and Crimson Tide, and Michael Bay, the director of Bad Boys. Welcome to The Rock. We got visitors. Sean Connery. You sure you're ready for this? I'll do my best. Your best? Losers always whine about their best. Yeah. Nicholas Cage. Listen, I'm just a biochemist. I drive a Volvo. Beige one. So what do you say you cut me some friggin' slack? Ed Harris. Fire. summer get ready to rock and welcome back guys so the synopsis for this film is a mild-mannered chemist and an ex-con must lead the counter-strike when a rogue group of military men led by a renegade general threaten a nerve gas attack from Alcatraz against San Francisco. It's an action adventure thriller. It's got a 136 minute runtime and it's classed as an R rated movie. And it's starring Sean Connery, the legendary actor, the legendary 007 who plays Mason, the um, SAS serviceman in this movie. And there's some uh, fan theories or people were talking about this on the internet when I was looking on the trivia for this film that people think that he's actually 007. Uh, there's some plausibility there that he is 007 locked up and he's brought back to save the day. So pretty good, um, pretty good theory there. A plausible one of that, and I guess you could just make your own mind up about that. But I think Sean Connery will always be 007 in some ways in these movies. And you've got uh, none other than Nicolas Cage. That's right, guys. Nicolas Cage is in this film, and on the lead up to this, I remember him being in films like Raising Arizona and Wild at Heart and Honeymoon in Vegas. So this is kind of like the start of him playing the action hero and he does it quite well actually being the action hero and still playing Nicolas Cage. And there's some pretty cool trivia here, I never knew this until I did um, the research for this show, is that Michael Bay asked Nicolas Cage to be like the Hooper character from Jaws. 
he said, watch, watch Jules, look at the Huber character, that's the sort of guy that I want. The, the, I suppose you can see it now, there's that bit in the, at the end of Jules when Hooper says to Brody, you know, be careful with those tanks, you know, they're going to blow up. So it's the same with um, Nicolas Cage's character with Sean Connery, he's got the VX Geff, be careful with it, you know. So now I know that, I can see that in the film, uh, funny enough. But with Nicolas Cage... I could talk about him all day. I could probably do a whole episode on him. Um, he's one hell of a character. And Dan Bone from Haunted Hill <laughs> podcast. You know what I'm saying, man. So it's um, he's probably one of the most photoshopped guys on the internet at the moment. But um, he, he seems like a really nice guy, though, in real life. I do like Nicolas Cage. But um, what I will mention is, uh, before I move on, is... is Going back to Nicholas Cage, blimey, once you start talking about the guy, you can't get away. Um, he went on to go and do films like Con Air and Face Off um, and got in 60 seconds. So this was kind of like a relaunch of his career. I mean, he was already good doing what he was doing, but this kind of put him up into that sort of real A-list action hero bracket in Hollywood. So there you go, it's a little bit about him. Um, I'll just say Nicholas Cage one more time. There you go. Wow, can't stop saying his name now. Um, right, who else we got in this film? Uh, Ed Harris, he plays General Hummel, and he's in films like Apollo 13 and National Treasure. And Michael Bean's in this movie, who we all know as uh, Higgs from Aliens and Carl Reese from Terminator, probably two of his famous roles in Hollywood. And he comes back here to play a Navy SEAL. He plays Captain, or no, Commander Anderson. And it's the second time he's played a Navy SEAL for Michael Bay because he was in a movie called Navy SEALs, funny enough, with Charlie Sheen. And Tony Todd's in this film. He's always good when he turns up. Uh, he really brings real conviction to his characters. The Candyman. And he kind of plays that sort of character in this. He plays a real psychopathic Marine, um, which I'll get into later on. So it's, um, it's a really good cast, uh, this film. You know, you've got some really good actors and that's just a name, just a few in this film with everything else so let's talk about the director it's Michael Bay um, he loves a good old punch up action movie explosions all that sort of stuff and he's done Transformers um, Bad Boys and Armageddon bloody hell what a movie that is <laughs> crazy crazy movie so he likes explosions and actions and that's what you get in this film and it's produced by Jerry Bruckheimer one of my favourite directors producers and he famously says in interviews when I make a film, I just want to make a film that I like to go and watch at the cinema, and he does that for us. I'm, I'm never really disappointed with a, a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. Um, I mean, going right back to the roots, he's involved with Beverly Hills Cop, Top Gun, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, just a name, just a few. And you get his signature logo at the beginning of the movie, where it's like a road um, with a tree and some lightning coming down. So. You kind of know you're in for a good ride when you see Jerry Bruckheimer's name come up. So I've got a lot of time for this guy. Um, and you can bet your bottom dollar that Michael Bay put that script in front of him and said, this is what I've got, and he's gone. Well, I could probably change it and just make it that little bit better. And uh, he probably did that. Who knows? And whilst I was talking about those old old movies, bloody hell, cool, I'm old now. Um, Beverly Hills Cop and Top Gun, you, also, you had Dom Simpson attached to those films with Jerry Bruckheimer, and you see that at the beginning of the movies. And unfortunately, Don Simpson passed away during the production of this film, so um, the film was dedicated to him. You see that at the end credits. So a little shout out to uh, Don Simpson in, in respect for this movie and what a great movie it is. And let's talk about the music. So it's uh, another legendary um, composer, which is Hans Zimmer. He does the music to this film. It's great. It's a great soundtrack. Um, as I said before in previous episodes, I always think that music to films is another character and, and they're, they're helping the, you along with the film and the action and everything that's going on. So I, I love the soundtrack to it straight away when I watch this film. The music right at the beginning, it just draws you straight in. So um, all credit to Hans Zimmer for this soundtrack. And I believe that he is also the sort of like the right hand man for Michael Bay. I think he did the... I think he might have done the music to Transformers and Armageddon and Con Air movies like that. So he is like the sort of go-to guy. And the film was made for $75 million and when it was released in 1996 in June, it was a smash hit at the box, box office and it made a return of $335 million uh, worldwide. So it did really well. 
And one more thing before I would talk about the movie is that The Rock was supposed to be a straight, intense action movie. It wasn't supposed to be as funny as it is with all the humour. And the reason why it is is because the cast got on so well and everybody started having a laugh on set. People started ad-libbing lines. I imagine Nicolas Cage had a lot to do with that. And even Ed Harris couldn't stop laughing at the scene when he's when the tour guide is showing him around Alcatraz. He just kept on laughing every time he saw the dude who looked like a sort of scout leader. So it was a fun set to be on, looking at all the trivia and that people got on. And even uh, Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery got on well together. So I actually think, you know, talking about that, the humour in this movie worked so well with the blend of action and everything. And it just... Um, it's almost like the planets kind of align with this movie. Everybody I speak to about The Rock, um, very rarely do I meet someone who says, I don't like that film. And people like it because of that aspect. It's got humour, it's got action, it's kind of got something for everybody in it. So, um, on the whole, it works. And with all the actors and directors and everything which I just spoke about, I think it's just like someone's put it into a cauldron and they've just conjured up a really good film and this is the end result. So... There you go, I thought I'd just quickly mention that before I get onto the film. So let's have a look at The Rock then. So the building block of this movie is um, you've got a disgruntled Brigadier General who's done secret ops for the government and this is Frank Hummel, the Ed Harris character. And he's a war hero, he's a highly decorated um, general and he's served his country very well, he's done many tours in Vietnam. But the government have let him down, um, all the fallen soldiers who, has, who he has worked with in the past their families were not compensated the right money so he's got a big dig with the government and this is like the central focus of the story so in order for him to negotiate with the government he's going to hold them at ransom with the VX gas rockets and um, take over Alcatraz and he says that if he doesn't get the money he will release the gas on to uh, San Francisco and also, when you look at this, this kind of echoes the Snake Plissken character as a disgruntled um, ex-war hero. So I just picked up on that. That's just me being a Carpenter fan. So with uh, General Hummel and his elite group of Marines, who he said they will give a million dollars for um, if they accomplish this task, is given a certain amount of time, I think it's about 48 hours or something like that, for the ransom money to be delivered. So the government are negotiating what they're going to do and their primary objective is to actually blow up Alcatraz with some uh, thermite charges from the FA-18s but they have not been tested. So they go for a plan B option and they decide to uh, use Michael Bean's SEAL team to go in and take out the Marines but they do not know the layout of Alcatraz and there's only one guy that does and who are you going to call? Yep, yeah, that's James Bond. Sean Connery, who plays the character Mason, who famously quotes in this movie, I've been in jail longer than Nelson Mandela, maybe you want me to run for a president. Absolute brilliant line. And because of the chemical biological threat, they're going to need their best lab rat. And they get Nicolas Cage, who's that guy. He's the guy who has no field experience as an FBI agent, and he is out on the limb here. And he's also the only bloke who can persuade Sean Connery to do the assignment in one of the funniest scenes in the movie when... Uh, Nicholas Cage's character, Stanley Goodspeed, is interrogating Mason. And uh, it's just Hollywood gold. So Mason decides to go to the rock and he's a little baffled that it's been turned into a tourist attraction. And the reason why he's the man for the job is because he knows the place inside out. But before he does that, he says he wants a nice hotel room and a suit and a haircut. So he goes to a hotel room, gets a shower, a haircut and a nice suit and he ex plans his escape but not before he deals with FBI agent Womack who I forgot to mention and he's the guy who put him into jail because of some microfilm from the 60s or something like that with the Roswell landings and all that so they wanted to put him away to shut him up so he gets his own back here and he chucks Womack over the um, balcony with some shower cord and it's quite a funny scene actually because as he's throwing them over the guys the FBI got guys downstairs having some buffet are tucking in and in the background you've got the music I'm leaving on the jet plane and it's like hold me like you never let me go as he's hanging on so it's just a it's a clever little bit of directing there just to chuck that in so it's quite a funny scene so after this Mason gets away and he steals a hummy from a guy and then Nicholas Cage decides to 
common deer someone's Ferrari and they're in a chase around um, San Francisco and it's almost like a homage to bullet but there's explosions and there's fire hydrants going up in the air and it's a really good scene it's a, it's a really good chase action scene that goes on for about 10 minutes in the movie and um, Michael Bay actually said it caused him a bit of a nightmare because he actually won he filmed it on the streets of San Francisco and he went through all sorts of hell trying to get permits for this and um but after all this carnage, uh, Mason's real motive here is to see his daughter, who he hasn't seen all these years, as a little bit of a backstory. And he says to her, look, you know, I'm, I'm planning to come back. I want to try and make things right. I want to try and make some time up with you. And um, Nicholas Cage does a really good thing here, as, um, or Stanley Goodspeed. He goes up to him and says, uh, well, Mason, we better get back. And he says to the daughter that, um, you know, your dad's helping us with an assignment. So he, he does the right thing, but then at the same time, he says... Don't you ever do that again? And he goes, well, my jaw is hurting like hell because he smacked him earlier. So, um, at the same time, you know, the screen time between these two actors is brilliant in this film, so it's great. So after this, they go back to the FBI headquarters and they plan the um, assault on Alcatraz with um, the Navy SEAL Captain Michael Bean. And this is where Mason comes out and says, you know, I don't, don't have any plans I'm not going to write them out they're all up in my head so he goes with them and because of the VX gas uh, standing good speed has to go as well and he's not too happy with this because he's not too good on the field with weapons or anything like that so with the seals and Mason and good speed they infiltrate Alcatraz through a underground furnace via a water duct and some diving equipment and stuff like that and very early on they trigger an alarm for the marines that are taking the Alcatraz hostage and there is a firefight between the marines and the navy seals and all the navy seals including uh, Michael Bean get killed and this just leaves uh, Mason and Goodspeed they're the only hope they're the only guys that can save the day but before they do that Mason throws all his equipment down and says that's it I've had enough I'm out of here but then Goodspeed says to him well it's not just a hostage situation that um the, we've got to tell you that they've actually got VX gas and they're going to destroy San Francisco and wipe out all its population. So Mason and Goodspeed team up and this is where the film kind of turns into a bit of a die-hard situation um, on a different sort of spin. And they're walking down in the underground sewers and the Marines um, find out that they're down there and they try to flush them out with some um, napalm explosives. And then the film from here onwards you get some action scenes, you get them going into the morgue and taking on some marines and there's some firefights and then Goodspeed says the best thing I can do is try and find all these rockets and then take all the microchips out of them which will make the rockets just drop into the water after they've launched so you get um, some really good action scenes here, it gets a really good firefight in the morgue between um, Mason and the marines and you've got a scene here where they're on a minecart which kind of reminded me of um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom so they're in this car and they're shooting at the Marines and Goodspeed learns to use a gun and I think this is where he starts to man up a little bit and he starts to find himself and um, so along the way they eliminate several Marines and they manage to disable 12 of the 15 rockets but they've still got three that they need to get to and things are going a little bit south so Mason decides to surrender to General Hummel to give uh, good speed a little bit of time to disable the rest of the rockets and you get a pretty good scene here between uh, General Hummel and Mason where they realize that they are basically the same type of character really and Mason learns that um, General Hummel is not going to pursue this task you can just tell it by his eyes and then at the same time you get uh, good speed trying to deactivate some rockets and you get a funny scene here between him and the Marines because they come down from the roof and as uh, he's trying to deactivate this rocket he goes I'm going to take pleasure in going you boy so <laughs> and then he knocks good speed out and uh, Mason and good speed find themselves in a prison cell and Stanley is reciting what that marine just said and he goes I'm going to take pleasure in going you boy and he says what is this Mason is this like a sort of 16 year old I'm angry with my father syndrome it's quite a sort of funny line and then he says to him, okay, so you got through that furnace and that was pretty cool by the way. And then you managed to swim through the water and get away from the, from Alcatraz. And he said, that's pretty cool. But how in the hell 
of Zeus's butthole did you get out of your cell? And then you got uh, Mason, he's got this bit of bedding and he manages to open up the cell and then uh, Goodspeed is kind of like, oh, oh, okay. So then they go and try and de deactivate these last rockets and at the same time General Hummel has said to the remaining Marines, I said the mission's over, I'm not going to release the rockets. But then the other uh, Marines, including Tony Todd's character, says, well, we need to prepare the launch and he pulls a gun on Hummel and he takes over uh, the situation and he sets up the rockets for a launch. The launch takes place but the missile is disguided by uh, Hummel on his computer and it falls into the water which is leaving one more rocket on the roof. So Sean Connery says um, you take out the rocket I'll go and see Hummel. So then you get like a final action scene here where you get like a firefight between the marines and um, Hummel and then you've got Nicolas Cage having a punch up a marine on the roof and he takes out one of the glass balls from the rocket and he chucks it into the marine's mouth and he sort of punches him in the mouth and you get quite a horrible scene here where he's sort of like sort of puking up and stuff and then Goodspeed has to get this syringe and he chucks it through his heart sort of to uh, like an instant inoculation to stop him from um, getting infected with this um, biological agent you also get a final scene with Tony Todd here, I forgot to mention before this scene, is where um, Goodspeed says to him, do you know the Elton John song called Rocket Man? And Tony Todd goes, no, I don't listen to that music. And he says, well, you should do because you're the Rocket Man. And he punches the button and the rocket goes straight through him and he goes flying out the window and then he gets impaled onto a fence. So it's a pretty cool scene. And um, so going back to the rooftop with Nicolas Cage where he's got that needle in him, um, at the same time, the government have authorised the Fermite Plasma um, explosives to be used by the FA-18s because they've lost contact with um, Mason and Good Goodspeed, so this is their last resort. So you've got the jets coming down, and then you've got a really good scene with Nicolas Cage, and he's got like two flares, two green flares, and he's waving them through the air. And then the FA-18s are coming down, and then they, they notice him. But just before they are bought, they set off the thermite um, charges and there's a big explosion and he goes into the water. And this kind of ties up to the final scene because um, they've accomplished their mission. The FBI turn up and Goodspeed talks to FBI agent Womack and he says to him that Mason got taken out by the thermite charges. But that wasn't the case because... Um, Mason rescued Godspeed from the water after he went, in, went, went plunging in after the explosion and then they spoke to each other and then um, Mason gives him the location to the microchip and then Godspeed gives uh, Mason the location to a hotel room, some money and some change of clothes and that and he says that all the diving equipment's still there so you can get away and then I'll just tell the FBI that you're dead so they part really good ways here, they're like a friendship and um, it's a really good way that the movie ends. And then after that, uh, the final scene of this movie, I think is almost like a homage to a film called Raising Arizona because you've got Nicolas Cage running into a church and he manages to get the uh, microchip and his wife's waiting for him outside in the car and he comes running out and he's got his almost like a sort of Cameron Poe outfit on. He's got like a sort of vest on and a hat. And... Um, and he's sat in the car with a microchip and he says, Honey, do you want to see who really killed JFK? And that's it. And that's how the film ends. So that is it. That's The Rock, guys. That is The Rock in a bite size. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. If you have seen it, hopefully you're a fan like I am. And like I said at the beginning of the show, guys, uh, The Rock is just one of those films that's pretty much got it all um, in terms of action, movie, comedy, adventure, um, everything. So, and... Um, I would say it actually double bills with another film which I'm going to be covering, which is Con Air. The two go together, so I thought I'd do that as the next episode, so look out for that. I'll be um, covering that soon. And uh, that's it, guys. So as a little bit of admin for the show, as I always say, um, I am a proud member of Legion Podcast. So go check out all the other shows. I will leave um, a promotion at the end of the show. And also... Um, Check out the Facebook page, we're having a good time on there, some really good stuff going on. And you can also find the show on iTunes and Stitcher, and I think there's a few other places as well, so check it out. Alright guys, so I'll leave it at that, 
and keep it bite size, keep it fun and I will see you soon. this show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema beef devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell Ming power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero go show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action legion after dark metal health obsessive cinema discourse Pick Six Movies, the podcast by the cemetery, the podcast on Haunted Hill, the Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.